Good afternoon. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I am thrilled to um, be able to be able to speak today at IOMT. Um, just a little more history on me. I've been a practicing dentist for 17 years. And, um, you know, in that 17 years, I've just started to think about um, what else is happening? What else is happening in this um, in this profession, in this relationship, in this situation, um, in these days that I spend um, calling myself a dentist. Alrighty, so the first thing I want to talk about is intention. And the quote goes, you are what your deepest desire is. As your desire is, so is your intention. As your intention is, so is your will. As your will is, so is your deed. As your deed is, so is your destiny. So the way I think about my life um, from the highest level is just what is my intention every day when I get up. And if I know what my intention is, um, that's what my goal is. And that's what my eyes are on. And whatever happens um, either serves my intention um, or it's just you know, entertainment along the way. That's the way I see it. My intention for this 50 minutes of us together is to understand the five levels of healing in one, um, one philosophical presentation, simple office environment uh, considerations, emotions healing and dentistry, what are different tools and techniques that I have learned, and what are additional training and learning opportunities that you might seek to um, choose. So this is, um, this is the reason that I look beyond um, what we normally talk about as dentists. And um, that's because, you know, dentistry does have the highest burnout rate of all professions. And I don't know about you, but some days are really stressful in my office. And, um, you know, those stresses come from employees, uh, capital expenditures, all the money that's going out. What am I doing to bring in new patients? You know, what kind of waste is happening with my staff? Um, what debts do I have to pay? What equipment should I buy? And this one, you know, like we, we give our hearts and we give our minds and we give our time to our patients, but we're always under this um, stress of what is the liability, what are the risks that I'm taking and possibly employing this treatment. Um, so in, in really evaluating this stress is when I started to look beyond, you know, beyond what are the physical, um, what are the procedures? What are the, um, uh, you know, beyond just fixing their teeth, what, what else are we doing in the office? This is a study, one of many, many studies that are out these days on just the effects of stress. And you know, what stress is doing to us is just shortening our life. So um, I actually have the pleasure of being married to a dentist. And the first year out of um, dental school, I met him, um, Bob Evans, and uh, he brought me to my first IOMT meeting in 1999. And um, it was actually in Atlanta, I remember clearly, at Hotel W. Um, but one of the things I've been able to observe in my 17 years of practice of coming to IOMT meetings on and off is just, you know, what, who are the dentists that are aging very well? And who are the dentists that the stress seems to be catching up to them? And what is that all about? So today I want to present um, a possibility. And one of the gifts I hope to give to you is to show you um, many different um, pieces of literature, many books that have been written that I refer to um, as I travel the different levels. So 
what is possibility? Possibility is a declaration of what we can create in the world each time we show up. It is a condition or value that we want to occur in the world, such as peace, inclusion, relatedness, or reconciliation. A possibility is brought into being by the act of declaring it. So for every patient interaction, I want, I want that to be positive. I want that to be pain-free, and I want that to be um, positive for them. So this is the five level, levels of healing philosophy present, presented by, um, that Dr. Klinghart talks about. So at the first level, we have the physical body, the energetic body, the mental body at the third, the intuitive body, and then the fifth being the spiritual body. Um, today I'm going to talk about what is the physical body. Then I'm going to break break it up and talk about many aspects of the second, third, and fourth levels because they kind of mesh into each other. And then there's the fifth level, the spiritual level. So I mentioned intention at the beginning of my talk. For me, intention sits right here. And you know, whether, you know, whatever your spiritual beliefs are, um, if intention sits here in the spiritual, then again, it's always the tip of your pyramid. And it's really always where your eye focus can be. One other thing I want to point out in this pyramid is, and um, you know, where I think it gets, uh, I don't know, um, what's the best word, maybe uncomfortable for some people is that, you know, as we move from the physical to the spiritual, it becomes more subjective. And then we move, when we move from the spiritual to the physical, it becomes more objective. So, you know, as dentists, we spend a lot of time trying to measure, trying to quantify, trying to polish, trying to shine, trying to, you know, do all the things that we do with our hands and our art. Um, but there's so much that's going on subjective. One of the things I learned recently is that our patients make up their minds whether or not they like us in about 30 seconds. You want to talk about something subjective? So that's really important to us, right? Whether or not they like us. Whether or not they're going to return. All right, Dr. Klinghart says, our patients need care on all levels of their existence. People really can recover from their chronic illness, but patients have to shift their way of being in the world on a deep level. They need our guidance, and they need our example. Um, this is the chart that clearly shows out how Dr. Klinghart thinks about the five levels. Um, it's way too busy uh, and too much data for this presentation, but if you want to find it, the link is right there. I'm going to pull different aspects of this chart out and kind of just dive deeper into them. So from my perspective, and I think most of you will agree, dentistry is primarily seen in the physical and thought of as a physical art um, and skill. Dr. Klinghart says in his writing, level one is the lowest or densest level, the physical body. The physical body or the physical reality is identical with what we can see, feel, hear, smell, and taste. It ends at the skin. It is what we perceive with our five senses. So the physical level is very, very important. Um, and there are, this is again, you know, this is the most objective level that we can talk about. And there are simple things that we can really consciously think about and bring into our, our office and our environment that help our, um, our relationships and our patient experiences. One of the things that I would recommend everybody to do is to seek out a feng shui practitioner and have their office um, uh, healed from a feng shui uh, philosophy. 
Um, and it's not that this will cost you a lot of money. There are very simple things that can be done. Um, but from my experience, it makes a really big difference in how the patients perceive uh, your office. And just thinking about this, like, um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that I have is, like, why did I become a dentist, right? Because I really hate being a dental patient. I remember my first experience as a dental patient, and the dentist was like, I think you need some nitrous. <laughs> I said, okay. <clears throat> so we did that, and I got through it. But one of my goals is just to create a, um environment and a situation that patients like me can, um, can have a good experience. Really look at the artwork and the color of your walls and any symbols that you may have around your office. Um, also, be really aware of where your equipment is sitting and what's in the view of your patients. Um, they don't know what most of that stuff is, and so they make up stories about how scary it is. All right, something else to think about, um, and I hope you all do, is just what the music is that your patients are listening to. Um, one of the best thing that, things that's happened in our office since our latest renovation is that we can choose the music in each room. Um, and so I will seat the patient, and either I or my assistant will ask the patient what kind of music they want to listen to that day. And um, I've only had to veto maybe one out of a hundred. And you know when you get a really great patient because you know what they say? What do they say? They say, you choose. Exactly. They say, you choose. I want you to be happy. And you say, oh, okay. Good. And there's actually research and the most effective um, composers, you know, classical music actually makes our brain waves uh, function most harmoniously. Um, Bach, Mozart, Vivaldi, and Scarlatti uh, are the top of the line choices. Um, and again, so now I'm going to move to the second, third, and fourth level after we get this magic fix. And again, it's the energetic, mental, and intuitive bodies. So why don't I do this? I'll tell you. Um, I'll tell you uh, about our center. Um, so we are in. We're called Groton Wellness. We're located in Groton, Massachusetts. We're about 45 minutes northwest of Boston. Um, the unique thing about our center is that we not only have a biological dental component, but we have a um, medical center, a detox center, and a, a cafe. Um, I'm also looking to add a psycho-emotional component to it. And, um, you know, that's, I have about 65 employees, and so I'm, because I have not only dentistry and medicine, um, and a spiritual-emotional component, that's why I spend most of my days thinking, um, you know, as I'm at the chair, working, you know, what is healing, and what are these patients doing, and what's working, and... You know, as uh, I'm sure all you know, like having practiced for 17 years, we learn so much from our patients. And, um, you know, we have, uh, when you have long-term relationships, again, you're watching who's aging really well and what are they doing, what, what components of their life do they nurture, and who can you witness that life is being really hard on. And, you know, what's, what's going on with them? And, you know, one of the things that I've come to learn is that um, the more you can let the water run off your back and the quicker you can let the water run off your back, no matter what life serves you, um, the less it's going to attach. And um, the less it attaches, the less it's going to affect you down the road physically. Um, because one of the things that they talk about in uh, European biological medicine, I don't know who studied that most, is that everything physical first starts as an emotional um, event. 
right? So whether that's something that happened to you as a child, or whether that's a divorce, you got divorced, your parents got divorced, it's a traumatic car accident. Um, how, how were you able to process that event? And how were you able to make sense of that? I don't know, that's just one of the pearls that I've learned and that I try to practice. And, um, you know, even when with 60 plus employees and crops hitting the fan, Am I letting that, how am I letting that affect me and how am I not? And is it really so extreme that I'm going to let it, you know, bring me down and affect my health? Or is it simply going to be water under the bridge when I think about it next year? Alrighty. Has everybody read this book? Yeah. In my research, this was one of those that I found. And um, so what I'm looking at is just... Um, what do people think about dentistry and, and culturally how have we um, how have we held that how have we thought of it um, so one of the quotes there is it says dentistry has become much more complex than the term oral care previously implied this awareness brings us closer to reconciling mankind's love-hate relationship with his teeth and oral care provider yeah how many times do they come in and they say, I really like you, but I don't want to be here? Yeah. Alrighty, so one of the things I'm looking to do is just really co-create the experience with my patients. Um, and co-create means that, yes, I'm there and I have an intention to do a procedure, but they're also there. And how they feel that day and how fast we're going to go or how slow we're going to go or how much TLC is going to be needed in that visit is really co-created in the moment. And that's always a variable that I'm managing. Um, awesome book here uh, called Flow, written by Mahali, whoever can say this last name. So this is a quote that I want everybody to take in, and I, and I love to tell my staff, I'd love to read this to my staff. So contrary to what we usually believe, the best moments in our lives are not the passive, receptive, re relaxing times. The best moments usually occur when a person's body, mind, body's mind, or body's uh, person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something different and worthwhile. Optimal experience is something that we make happen. I think that's pretty cool. And I say, I tell my staff this because I don't know about you, but I like to stretch their mind. The positive thinker sees the invisible, feels the intangible, and achieves the impossible, especially when they have technical difficulty. So, <clears throat> words matter. Words matter so much, and every word carries an energy and an intention. Um, incredible book here by Robert Tennyson Stevens called Conscious Language. <clears throat> Speech is the conscious direction of breath from our lungs turned into sound currents crossing over our vocal cords. Those sound currents shaped by our tongue, mouth, tongue, mouth, and lips become words which have power to give or take life. Something you all should know about is called uh, neuro-linguistic programming. Um, one of the things we often hear patients say is, I hate my teeth. Right? Then I say to them, like, why do you hate your teeth? If you hate your teeth, we're kind of dead in the water. We have to love your teeth. We have to think about your teeth as 28 or 32 little flowers that we're nurturing. And we don't know how many of those flowers we're going to end up with by the time you die, but we're going to do our darndest to hang on to every one of them. Right? So they start nurturing their flowers. Communication. I took this quote from Panky. It is such an important part of dental practice. And again, communication. What's so most important about communication is choosing our words. Um, as an effective communicator, we must demonstrate integrity, 
Um, being a biological holistic dentist, especially eccentric like I can be, it's really important for me to portray integrity. And yes, one of the things that I want to say is that the first thing that we have to do as dentists is be really great in the physical. Right? We have to have great physical skills. We have to have exceptional knowledge. We have to do great work. As biological dentists working outside of the box, we have to be even better than our conventional colleagues. And it's when we can master those skills, the art skills, that we can then go into um, these higher levels. The doctor-patient relationship. This fascinates me. And I think that you all can relate to it. Because one of the things that we hear from our patients are all their bad dentist stories. You know, like I went to this dentist and oh my god, I, this happened and it was so horrible. So what can we do in the doctor-patient relationship to nurture that, that experience? And this quote says, the idea that the caregiver herself or himself and what she brings to the caring situation as a person is more important to the outcome of the care than the choice of technique that she employs in the giving of that care. So I think it's really important what occlusion technique that you, that you choose. But what's more important is the care that you're giving each time you meet with them. Um, emotional intelligence. Yeah, so there's a way to quantify your emotional intelligence by taking this pretty simple test. Um, nice thing to do when you hire uh, new employees, new associates. Um, our emotional minds shape our destiny. I'm going to talk about some emotions that are very present in dentistry next. <coughs> I don't know about you, but some days I see a lot of fear and anxiety. And I thought it was interesting to go into and understand the difference between fear and anxiety. So anxiety is something that we carry um, for a long period of time. Fear happens immediately prior to an experience. So I am not a roller coaster person. I kind of felt childbirth was like a roller coaster. I have three children, right? Natural childbirth. When that started, I was like, oh my God, I'm on the roller coaster until this ends. But that was, you know, that was the fear and anxiety that I was trying to, I was acknowledging and then trying to move past. Um, so this is a diagram that just shows what, who it is that we're dealing with. Um, there are some patients that are very fearless. These are the usual ones, kind of middle of the road. And then these are the ones that we take really deep breaths to get through our day. Uh, fear. One of my favorite books. Whoops, sorry. So love is letting go of fear. One of the best ways to get over fear is to just try to love through it. Love your patients, acknowledge their fear, honor their fear. Fear can be known as the most virulent and damaging virus known to mankind. Most of the world's belief systems of how we communicate with each other are based on fear. Um, in the world of neurolinguistic programming, going back to words, just pay attention to how many times uh, your friends, your family talk to you in a fear-based way. Uh, okay, then we're going to talk about pain. Again, an awesome book, The Gift of Pain. I'm, I'm sometimes tempted, you know, and I have to make really bad dental jokes, but to tell my patients, there's a really great book called The Gift of Pain when they come in. They don't like that. Um, all right, so the United States seeks to avoid pain at all costs. What we need to realize is that some pains uh, have no physical stimulus whatsoever. And they are going to be uh, emotionally based. Um, and so one of the things that I often ask when a patient comes in with uh, idiopathic pain that we're trying to seek the root of is just what's going on in the rest of their life. 
what's stressful? You know, oftentimes it's their dog's not doing well, their mom's not doing well, they lost their job. Can be so related to how they're presenting. Pain drugs are the second largest pharmaceutical class globally after cancer medications. Um, you know how often we're asked for pain prescriptions. And it's just important to just be conscious of how often are we writing it for physical pain versus emotional pain. The most toxic emotion that has been present in the dental office over time is shame. Um, I just want to bring this to your awareness and perhaps we can um, refrain from, from shame. Uh, so there's a quote, my teeth are the worst the dentist has ever seen. I feel guilty, ashamed, and scared of the lecture. I'm worried that the dentist will berate me, humiliate me, or judge me. Um, you know, I, I work really hard not to shame my patients, very hard, and I work really hard with my uh, hygienists so that they can use words that actually positively encourage um, better care versus, uh, you know, scolding them for not taking care of themselves. Empathy and understanding and loving ourselves through the process of owning our story is the bravest thing we'll ever do. And there's so much that we're all dealing with, right? God, it's Earth, it's 2017, there's so much going on. It's not easy. It's not easy to deal with our lives, let alone take care of our teeth. So how can we pull out compassion? How can we be more compassionate? I just want you to know about this, this book, uh, Fearless Heart. It's tied to something I'm going to show you, a training, uh, training center, training program that they're having at Stanford University now um, through the Compassion Institute. Um, awesome. Listening. Uh, I probably listen more than I talk. I try to do that in my life, but I definitely do that when I'm treating patients. Because really what they want to tell you is how they are, how they're feeling, what's going on. They want to know that you heard them. If they don't think that you heard them, they're not going to hear you. Right? Do weathered practitioners know that? Do you guys agree? If they don't think you've heard them, they're not going to hear you. Yeah. So um, for you younger people, it works for marriage too. <laughs> All righty, learn to listen, make your patients feel important, give your patients every reason to believe you can do the work. Sometimes with listening comes tears. So when it's necessary to make time for that, um, do. Because there's something about coming to the dentist and really stepping to that place of vulnerability for them that a lot of patients will cry. And, um, you know, I think that if your patients are comfortable to cry in your chair, like, that's success. Yeah, it takes up a little extra time, but you've really made them feel comfortable. And then there's hope. Norman Cousins, Anatomy of Illness. He says, nothing I've learned in the past decade at medical school seems to me more striking than the need, for, need of patients for reassurance. Illness is a terrifying experience. Something is happening that people don't know how to deal with. They are reaching out not just for medical help, but for ways of thinking about catastrophic illness. They are reaching out for hope. You know, they're oftentimes reaching out to us not in relationship to their catastrophic illness, but just am I, am I going to be able to get through this dental procedure? And how is it going to go? And are you going to be there for me? And are you going to listen? Are you going to respond? if I'm in pain. So important. Alrighty, a few tools and techniques. Um, sorry, just to go back there. That's one of my dental operatories. Uh, just try to keep it super clean. So I'm actually tied in now to the Mass General um, Psychiatric Institute. Uh, the Psychology Institute. It's called the um, Benson Henry Mind Body Institute at Mass General. And one of the things that we don't get enough as dentists is um, psychology training, in my opinion. Um, and one of the things that's really important to know in psychology is what is, what is shadow. 
Um, and so the way I describe shadow is like any time that we're triggered by a patient, we're just, that's our shadow. That's something that we've denied in ourselves. Okay? So a good example, a really big learning for me was to understand that um, that patient that was needy and extra sensitive that drove me nuts was like me. That was like a huge part of me that I was not acknowledging. So when I realized that, I went, oh my, wow, okay. Now I can pull out some more compassion for that person. Um, really important to understand shadow. And the more that um, we understand about ourselves and our inner, inner workings, the more I feel like we're going to understand our patients. So um, positive feedback relationship. If there was one slide that I would describe as my juice in this whole presentation, it's really positive feedback relationship. So what we know about um, what we know about everything that's here is that at the end of the day, it's all just en energy manifested in a physical form, right? It's just energy. It's just sometimes it shows up as a human, sometimes it shows up as a wall, sometimes it shows up as a casino, but broken down, it's just energy. So when we enter, when we encounter another human, we have the ability to um, make that a great uh, interaction or a negative interaction. Um, but positive feedback relationship is just the idea that, so I'm a dentist, and a new patient comes in, and they want to know information that I know, right? They want knowledge, and then they're taking that knowledge and they're accepting it. And then they're through their acceptance and understanding of the information that I'm giving them, they're giving me positive feedback. And then I'm giving them positive feedback. And we're doing this like infinity loop dance, right? So anytime a new patient comes in, I'm like, wow, who's coming? Who is this? What am I going to learn? What kind of infinity dance are we going to be able to do? Um, and yes, here's a study that actually... Um, quantifies uh, positive emotions versus negative emotions. And um, this is a huge skill being a dentist, right? And that just goes back to those patients that come in and they're like, oh, ugh, I don't want to be here today. Why do we have to do this? Is this going to hurt? Uh. So we are like constantly, we need to be able to counter all of that negativity with our positive. And that takes a lot of work. So mind-body medicine. Mind-body medicine is the self-care aspect of psychosomatic medicine designed to reduce stress and build resiliency. In our stressful world, we need to build resi resiliency. Key, key, key. Mind-body hypothesis. The environment is biology and mind-body in unity. Psychosocial stress leads to cellular oxidative stress. That's the aging that I was talking about earlier. Cellular oxidative stress leads to vulnerability. So um, how do we thrive? How do we thrive as dentists in one of the most stressful um, occupations that we have on the planet? We learn some mind-body medicine. We learn how to do relaxation response. We need to break the train of our thoughts. We need to learn vehicles like mind-body stress reduction, yoga, tai chi. Um, all of these things have been proven, and there's so much. There's so much information. There's so many studies that have been done on mind-body medicine that just have not infiltrated uh, primary care and/or um, integrative medicine like they're going to be soon. Um, yes. So two basic steps necessary to elicit the relaxation response, repetition of a word, sound, prayer, thought, phrase, or muscular activity, the passive return to repetition when other thoughts intrude. So, um, you know, if you've been practicing dentistry for any period of time, it actually doesn't take much brain uh, activity to do the work that we're doing because we've... Um, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. It's actually a beautiful study of a, um, a professional pianist. And uh, the more trained and the more uh, experienced the pianist, 
the less brain waves that they had to use. So my point is that um, we can do really deep work as dentists, and we can do uh, mind-body relaxation at the same time. We can also um, focus on our breath when we're in the chair. You know, the time that you're like, you know, given the fifth Novocaine shot and they're still having pain, and you're 30 minutes or an hour behind, it's really the time to focus on our breath. All right, so then we get to the fifth spiritual level. Um, again, that's where intention lives. I believe our intention should live. Um, again, definitely more subjective. So this slide just says, and I don't know if, if everybody knows this book, Vibrational Medicine by Richard Gerber, but it's old, it's old, but it's one of the best out, out there about um, energy medicine. So the middle of this quote says, once we begin to understand that we are primary spiritual beings working through the limitations of physical body, our consciousness begins to change. Uh, studies on spirituality and resiliency show... Um, as long as we have some spirituality, some thought, some idea that there's a bigger presence beyond us, that increases our, um, we have an increase in positive expectations, decrease in perceived stress, increase in social support and pro-social behavior, uh, many downstream benefits for health. I want you guys to know about, um, this is the first textbook that was written about spirituality and healthcare by Christina Polchowski. She's at um, George Washington University. They have a yearly conference um, that I hope to attend next year. And then I just wanted you to know about different training programs that are out there. If anybody's interested in learning more, um, if anybody's interested in these topics at all, please come talk to me. Uh, I would love to explore additional ways of training um, or learning from each other. Uh, again, there's just so much going on in that dental chair, in that dental office. Um, so shadow work, we talked about shadow before. Um, this is the training that I'm doing through Mass General in Boston. Uh, Vincent Henry Institute Stress Management and Resiliency Training. Uh, it's primarily online. Um, there, the program has only been in existence, I believe, two or three years. There are very few um, smart trained providers out there. Um, and they are unfortunately not marketing this to dentists at all, um, which I really, really think they should. This is the Compassionate Care uh, Institute at Stanford. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just thrilled that these big universities are looking deeper into uh, mind-body aspects. Don't know if anybody's heard about the Mankind Project, um, personal growth and development really uh, helps you look at your own your own life, your own stuff, and how to transform and do what you really want to do. Uh, Women Within International is just the women's component of that. Um, I'm always looking at either Yankee Dental or, um, you know, the New York Dental meetings that are in my area. Like, what's happening? What, what, what's out there? Is there anything that's being taught um, to dentists about emotional intelligence or uh, interaction with patients and spirituality, uh, energy medicine? Um, and there's so little, but I did want you to know about this class that's given by um, the Fraser Institute, I believe. I don't think I saw a posting of the next date, but I do know that it's out there. And then Landmark Forum. Again, really, really digging in and looking at your stuff and your life. And um, that just goes back to the idea that the more we know about ourselves, the more we understand ourselves, the more compassion and understanding we have for ourselves, the more that we will be able to give our patients. And that's my final slide. Blessings. Thank you for your time.